Hi, everybody. This is Matthias Friedrich uh, from sunny Montreal. Uh, it's sunny, but it's relatively cold, but it's a beautiful day otherwise. So today's Journal Club, and uh, happy to welcome you all, <clears throat> is about uh, a topic that is that has been on the radar since quite a while now. It's about cardiotoxicity and how we can detect that early. Um, the context is um, pretty clear. Um, cancer, especially breast cancer and uh, other soft tissue cancers, uh, often require chemotherapy. And while chemotherapy uh, has been increasingly successful and more and more people survive, actually, the sad part of this story is that more and more people then die from the complications of chemotherapy, of which cardiotoxicity is probably the most important one. In fact, there are data showing that um, if women uh, acquire breast cancer, the likelihood that they will eventually die from heart failure is higher than they would actually die from their cancer. So that's why there is a need for diagnostic tools to identify uh, cardiotoxicity early so that uh, doses of chemotherapy can be adjusted and uh, other therapy can be uh, introduced. So <clears throat> cardiotoxicity has been uh, already assessed by CMR um, since uh, almost 20 years, and uh, there have been some encouraging data, uh, especially using contrast-enhanced techniques, um, <clears throat> early gadolinium enhancement uh, especially, and also some uh, edema-related uh, techniques but um, now with, the, uh, with mapping becoming more and more popular, of course, mapping has become the focus of uh, new approaches to identify cardiotoxicity. And today we discussed two papers <clears throat> on that topic. And I also want to already welcome uh, Dr. Nigari Musabi from the McGill team. Uh, she's interested in the research and she will present the second paper. But I will just uh, guide us uh, through the first one. And I also welcome Fabian Mühlberg, the first author of this paper. Thanks, Fabian, for joining. Um, so in this paper, and I have to just right off the bat say, this paper is uh, a bit puzzling. So it has, has some surprising results. And we, at least I don't really know yet how to interpret them. <clears throat> so what they uh, did is they included a total of 30 patients uh, prospectively with a hypothesis uh, that cardiotoxicity induced by anthracyclines in, in, uh, in, the, cardiac, in the cardiac tissue uh, can be detected by CMR. They used a 1.5 Tesla system and uh, assessed patients within 48 hours before uh, anthracycline therapy, and then 48 hours thereafter, and then four weeks after. So before, early after, and then four weeks after. So they performed T1 mapping and T2 mapping and they've got linear enhancement, fairly standard sequence. I will not go into detail in that one. The, in, uh, the analysis was also pretty standard. Uh, a mid-ventricular short axis slice, since we expect more global changes, that is not necessarily a limitation. Um, and uh, the average global values were um, used for the analysis. Uh, they, uh, the definition of cardiotoxicity was based on uh, a drop of the left ventricle ejection fraction by at least 10%. So that uh, is what they, well, that was the design in a nutshell. <clears throat> of these 30 patients, at least uh, at the end, uh, 23 data sets were available for the analysis. Uh, the patient characteristics are here in table one. So for all the details, as usual, you can download the papers as a club member uh, from, from our website. Um, nine patients of those uh, 23 data sets, uh, for nine patients actually experienced a uh, reduction of the ejection fraction by at least 10%. And uh, 14 uh, um, had uh, no difference. So these are, of course, limited numbers in terms of the sample size. So we have to keep that uh, in mind. So <clears throat> looking at the, at the morphological data, they also looked at mass, and they found that LV mass decreased over time. Now, that's already an interesting finding. It was not huge, the difference, but it may indicate just uh, less physical activity, uh, but may also be due to the therapy itself. And we'll come back probably to that a bit later. Um, so then in table 2A, uh, that's, oh, here are some examples of um, patients and here are the 
T1 maps at baseline and uh, 48 hours into uh, therapy. And uh, the key finding um, is actually, and uh, maybe I pull uh, that figure three right away because it's basically the, the central figure. Uh, the key finding was that patients with anthracycline related cardiomyopathy, they're in the lower panel here, showed a drop of the T1. And then going back to uh, values uh, similar to the values before chemotherapy, this was something that patients would, who did not have a drop in LV ejection fraction not show. So at least uh, not, not really nothing significant here. So uh, that is, of course, uh, a bit. And then, uh, yeah, the other findings were actually not very exciting. So T1 maps, they were not different. Uh, troponin levels were not really that different. Conduction abnormalities uh, were also not. It's not that there was a lot of, um, let's say, uh, uh, other exciting or, or new data out there. But this is, of course, a, a, an interesting finding. Why does T1 drop? Now, if we go to the paper, <clears throat> this is from the paper, um, the consensus paper on mapping. If we look at what causes a low T1, we basically, at least in, in the heart, we're mainly looking at Fabry's disease, and that's because we have a sphingolipid accumulation there, so that's, that's lipid. <laughs> we have iron that leads to a drop in T1, and then we have uh, other air, uh, other diseases that may lead to a lipid uh, uh, or fatty degeneration or li lipid accumulation. So that, of course, asks the question: What in cardiotoxicity leads to that? We would have more expected the opposite. We would have expected that there is acute inflammation that causes edema. Edema causes a prolongation of T1. So we would have expected an increase of T1. So that is a very Surprising finding, and uh, in the discussion, the authors, uh, they uh, mention that maybe uh, they also say they don't know what this could be related to. They mentioned that an increase of intracellular lipid contents may uh, affect that. <clears throat> On the other hand, when I did some reading, so if at all there is, uh, there is an, an increase of the lipid peroxidase, so, so lipids should be even broken down more than, than usual. Uh, so it is really unclear. So this is surprising. In science, this is sometimes the best thing that could happen because we may learn something. But uh, that, is, uh, that is definitely something uh, that we will have to keep in mind. And hopefully some more research is then done in the future uh, to look at that. But now that we have Fabian on the call, and I don't know whether Jeanette is already uh, on. She also wanted to, to join. But... Um, did you have any other ideas what this could uh, be caused by? Uh, is there any chance that this is somehow related to the, to the methodology or to heart rate or whatever? So what was your idea what could have caused um, the, this uh, surprising drop of T1 in acute cardiopathy? Yeah, good question. Um, so firstly, can, can you hear me, uh, Matthias, and all the others? Yes, yes. Perfect. We, we so, very well. Super. Um, yeah, so we asked ourselves the same question, basically. And, and, and to be honest, you, you summarized it quite well. Um, we don't know the final answer. Um, I have been... I have been speaking to to some physicists and and other RMR specialists, like after even after publication of the study, because the finding was really was really fascinating, also to us, and unclear. Um, so you mentioned the 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 change in the lipid contents, which I which I honestly um, I'm not super certain about because it's a, in in a time window of 48 hours. I wouldn't expect so mm -hmm. much difference in in lipid content of a cell, um, even not um, like even if you consider a, a toxic effect of a of a drug. Um, one one person I spoke to um, um, mentioned that there could be a, um, a toxic reaction within the cell that could um, even change um, the amount of iron in the cell. I'm not sure if that mm. is the final answer, um, but there was also a hypothesis which, which we found after, after publication of the study. Um, what we are currently doing is um, doing a follow-up study on this um, with patients who receive anthracyclines for the second time. So basically the mm. same subset of patients, but, but, but people who have um, recurrent uh, disease and, and have a second round of chemotherapy. 
and uh, and look if, if we can repeat the effect very mm -hmm. honestly or mm -hmm. uh, if it's just i mean we look in, at a number of nine patients it could also be a, yeah. a random effect um, but we try yeah. to, to to clarify yeah. that but the standard error doesn't or standard deviation doesn't indicate that this was just based on a very few outliers with a massive drop of t1 no. so that was not, okay so no. that, that's good any, and, any other yeah. And the, other, the other question, the other question was was around heart rate. So we, we tried to to exclude some confounders. Um, heart rate was was um, ex was completely similar in both in both groups. Um, we didn't find a, a difference in, in artifacts or in image quality or whatever. We really looked deep into that before before publishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what we also did, Matthias, I don't know if you hear me. Sorry for being late. Yeah. Um, um, we have defined in our working group a so-called um, uh, equivalence range that is defined as a gold standard, just really drop server variability is well accepted and uh, that is far away from that. We really had the same um, feeling at first as you had. Hopefully there is not something going wrong just with the technique or other stuff. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's certainly. So Andrew has a question. I don't know, Andrew. Do you want to uh, want me to read it for you, or do you want to just unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure. Yes. Uh, I was. I was wondering if anyone had any knowledge of animal studies that had looked histologically as to whether the the, the MRI findings can be confirmed in animals, and whether there's there's anything histologically that might uh, explain a drop in T1, abnormal mitochondrial function or accumulation of, uh, of those kind of lipid products. Is there someone on the call who has some knowledge on that? Um, so I, I did just just a very superficial uh, search um, in preparation. Of <laughs> and uh, I didn't find anything specific here. So there is... Uh, there, uh, in, in long term, of course, any tissue damage in long term could, could lead to lipid accumulation, but as Fabian pointed out, unlikely to happen that early. And then the, 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 the only other important impact on lipid metabolism is the lipid peroxidase activity increase. So that would also more cause the, the, the opposite. So um, we should also maybe not only focus on, on, uh, on lipids, but also on iron or well, possibly also susceptibility artifacts that we have. Basically, there are these small vesicles that are uh, that are generated in the extracellular space, and maybe we deal with a strong susceptibility artifact caused between these uh, these uh, uh, fluid vesicle vesicles and the surrounding tissue. So it's definitely leaves some open questions, but it's certainly very interesting, and it's great that you continue the research and we get some follow up data in the future. So um, let's move on to the next paper. Um, and this is by uh, um, a group here with Ottavio Rizzi, Coelho Filio. And the first author is Thiago Ferreira de Sousa. And it's uh, called Anthracycline Therapies Associated with Cardiomyocyte Atrophy and Preclinical Manifestations of Heart Disease. And uh, this was published in Jack Imaging, and Jack Imaging also, I want to point that out, has a, a, an entire uh, issue with papers on this. So there are several very interesting uh, papers on, on, on this topic, with some, uh, also some very good editorials, um, one of which I'll also mention later. But I would like now to hand over to uh, Negar Musavi. She's a, a CMR physician here at the Glen uh, Hospital in, uh, in Montreal, and she will she she has a research interest in cardiotoxicity and will walk us through uh, this paper. Do you want to share your screen, Gary? Uh, yes. Um, is it showing, Matthias? Um, can you try again? Because I think uh, you first had to wait until I stopped sharing my screen, and I stopped sharing, so you should be. Otherwise, I I can I can share back and then. Uh, uh, is it showing? Do the others see it? I. No, we see you. Oh, um, that's not good. <laughs> um, okay, can you try again, just with the share button again, and then point to uh, the the window with the with a paper on it. 
Yeah, now we're, now we're, we're perfect. In. Okay. okay, thank you, Sorry. Matthias. I don't know if the authors are on the on the call, Tiago or mm -hmm. Otavia. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate them on a very uh, interesting study published in Jacket Imaging. As Matthias pointed out, um, this is a this is an area. It's sort of uh, it's become um, recently a lot of there's a lot of interest in this. And anthracyclines, as uh, everybody knows, it's a, it's a major component of a lot of different types of cancer therapy. Unfortunately, the downside has been the cardiotoxicity and the um, irreversible cardiotoxicity in some instances. So in this study, the authors basically wanted to elucidate the mechanism of this anthracycline-induced uh, cardiotoxicity using the CMR markers, uh, including ECV, uh, the extracellular volume, which is a marker of interstitial fibrosis, and then the intracellular lifetime of water, a marker of uh, cardiomyocyte size. And the hypothesis was that these novel markers uh, could help uh, basically uh, elucidate the mechanisms of um, myocardial injury in breast cancer patients. Their focus was breast cancer patients, um, one of the major cancer uh, pa patients types that use um, uh, anthracyclines. So this was a um, prospective study, and they enrolled about 27 patients and uh, who were to undergo um, anthracycline therapy for their breast cancer. Everybody needed four cycles, and they excluded patients who had any contraindications to CMR, kidney disease, GFR of less than 40, history of MI, uh, heart failure, or moderate to severe um, valve disease. And basically, the, if you go to figure one, you see the, um, the algorithm of the study. Um, at baseline, patients get uh, CMR and biomarkers. And following the completion of the study, three consecutive CMRs plus the biomarkers. Um, and um, um, on top of the anthracycline therapy, patients also in 25 out of 27 received uh, radiotherapy and Herceptin was um, also started after the end of the CMR examination. So um, mainly anthracycline plus radiotherapy in these patients. In addition to CMR, they also um, did some blood work. They wanted to look at the um, association with biochemical abnormalities. So basically what they looked at was the CRP, the CK, CK, um, troponin T's and the lipid panels. The CMR was uh, performed in the three Tesla system, Philips system, and this is their CMR standard protocol basically, and they do black blood T2-weighted imaging, syn imaging, LGE and T1 mapping um, for the ECV and then the intracellular lifetime of water calculation and a look locker using a look locker sequence. So uh, let's look at the baseline characteristics. Um, basically, patients are 51 on average, uh, 51, 52 years uh, of age. Their Framingham risk score is basically five, so low risk. Um, their Framingham age adjusted risk is increments is 3%. Interestingly, about 15% are on both ACE and statins. And uh, so let's move on to the results. Uh, so uh, this is figure two. Um, a, B, C, D. So basically what we're looking at is the LV ejection fraction and the timeline from anthracycline initiation that they divided into quartiles. And so uh, here in A, you have a figure A, you have the LV ejection fraction. As you can see, significant uh, decline in the LV ejection fraction over the treatment uh, period. Um, um, the same for LV mass. Um, decline in the LV mass um, throughout the um, treatment and um, the same for LV mass index to the um, um, to endocytic volume, which is a, basically an index of LV remodeling. Um, so significant decline in all. And uh, on the other hand, the T2 um, the T2 ratio at mid level, mid myocardial level was significantly elevated. Um, and um, so they. Um, there was uh, also, um, uh, if we move on to figure three here, let's look at the ECV and association um, throughout uh, the anthracycline therapy and ECV and intracellular lifetime. You see a significant increase in the ECV, whereas there is a significant um, decrease throughout um, uh, in the intracellular lifetime uh, water, and there's association is in both in basically uh, linear. There's a linear association. Interestingly, though, when they look at the same thing uh, with the LV mass, 
um, the LV mass, um, um, the LV mass index was uh, associated with also um, with also the intracellular lifetime of water. Um, radiotherapy also was associated with worse LV remodeling um, that they assessed it through the LV mass index on endostatic ratio. Um, they also looked at the biochemical analysis, and um, the results are basically displayed in table two. When you look at the troponins, the troponins significantly increase in the quartile, in the middle quartile at about 120 days. So they go up, and then you can see they, the troponins actually decline afterwards. And the same with the CRP, similarly. Um, in terms of the um, framing camera score, when they uh, looked at the framing camera score, that would be, uh, let me see, in figure um, 4A. There was no association with the Framingham uh, risk score and the timeline, um, the timeline of the troponin. In terms of the LV, they also investigated the LV cardiomyocyte mass and association throughout. And um, LV cardiomyocyte mass basically was a product of one minus ECV, the intracellular volume fraction, and the total LV mass. So overall, throughout the then throughout the study period, it significantly declined, and uh, there was more pronounced decline in patients who had higher troponins. Um, this is basically a red graph. Looking at the LV ejection fraction, also. Um, uh, um, decline, the, the, the more pronounced decline was in about um, 200 days uh, after starting um, the anthracyclines. Um, so, um, so the, um, the, um, the cardiomyocyte index I talked about, I show, showed the figure, the net decline was about 30%. Um, and again, there was a big association with the troponin levels. When they, so there was, when they and looked at the LV cardiomyocyte mass, there was a big association, but when they did the similar analysis with the LV mass, there was no, um, there was no significant association with the, uh, with the troponin elevation. So suggesting that probably the LV cardiomyocyte mass is more sensitive than looking at the LV, total LV mass uh, um, to indicate uh, anthracycline injury. So how about predictors of LV dysfunction post anthracyclines? Uh, when we look in um, graph in figure five, basically, when they looked at, um, 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 so basically Y axis, your LV ejection fraction, and here you're, they're dividing uh, the patients into patients who had um, higher than median at, uh, of uh, intracellular lifetime of water in orange and patients who had uh, less than median um, of intracellular lifetime of water. So these patients who had um, higher than median, they actually had more pronounced and drop in, which is very interesting finding. I'm not sure why that would be the case, but so these patients who had higher uh, at baseline, higher than median, had more pronounced and drop in their LV ejection fraction. Uh, so let me make sure that we are not missing anything else. Uh, in terms of the um, other predictors, um, um, biomarker CRP at baseline um, in patients who had CRP at baseline more than median was also associated with higher rates of decline in their intracellular lifetime of water. LDL levels uh, was also associated significantly with the decline in systolic function. However, what was not uh, significant was the baseline CRP levels wasn't associated with uh, LVEF at any time before, during, and after anthracycline. Um, therapy. So very interesting study. Um, it's a small study, but um, they basically confirm what was known before that the LV mass in patients declines, but mechanistically the question was, what was the mechanism of this LV and decline in LV mass? And they're showing in the study um, through a, a longer follow-up over 700 days post-treatment um, that reduction in the LV mass most likely um, the predominant component could be uh, because of the decrease in the cardiomyocyte level atrophy, which they showed by the intracellular lifetime of water. And that's about it. Uh, that was the brief summary of the, uh, of the study. Matthias. Matthias, are you there? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah. So thank you very much for presenting this very complex paper. So 
if you would have to uh, say summarize your takeaway in one sentence, what what would it be? What's the, from your point of view the major message we get from this paper? So basically, they're confirming what we knew that the LV mass declines. However, um, so the question was, is it the ECV increase in uh, in um, it's all um, increases in ECV? But what they're showing is ba based on the data that we're getting uh, with the intracellular lifetime of water. So we know most likely the mechanism of this is. Um, um, basically reduction in the, your, uh, um, or basically the cardiomyocyte level atrophy that we have in these patients. Yeah, okay. So um, uh, what, uh, there is an actually an interesting, um, uh, an interesting, oh, let me just see, and it's this one. I mean, there's a, there are oh. some limitations in the study. There's no outcomes and, um, and then um, I'm not sure when these patients who have um, undergoing chemo, they're gonna, you know, their, um, their body surface area, their mass, they lose weight. So when we're indexing numbers, that's gonna be declined. I don't know how you take that into account uh, in your yeah. analysis. Yeah, so we have uh, two uh, experts on here on the call. One is uh, Reza Nezafat uh, from Johns Hopkins and Gen Jennifer Jordan from Wake Forest, who wrote together with Greg Hundley uh, um, a very interesting and, and good editorial on that, uh, pointing out some of the issues we have uh, uh, around quantifying ECV and what that means. And this, I recommend this paper because it's a very nice, it contains a very nice summary of how different pathologies may affect uh, intracellular extracellular space and uh, how we could use that for, for tissue uh, characterization. Um, and so, uh, Reza, uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on this paper? And maybe uh, briefly, because we're already close to the top of the hour, briefly, your take on the current status of uh, CMR tissue characterization in uh, cardiotoxicity. Reza? Uh, Hello, Jennifer. Do you want to jump in? I don't know. Uh, Riza may not hear. He says my voice doesn't work. Ah, um, uh, okay, okay. So Jennifer, um, what is your um, what is your take on on that paper and on, on the current status of CMR? Um, let me see. Are you? I think yeah, they have, they're having more time. Uh, yeah. On me. Oh, let me see whether I can unmute her. No, I cannot unmute her. So there's something. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Hi, oh. Jennifer. <laughs> Sorry, we had to unmute two different systems here. Um, yeah. I think this paper was really interesting um, in that it gave us, it starts to get us to understanding potential uh, causes for the underlying changes in the pathology that we detect with ECV. ECV is limited by just being a two compartment model. Is it intracellular changes or extracellular changes? And as this figure here kind of sketches out in a very rudimentary fashion, there are a number of different reasons why the ECV or ICV or cardiomyocyte mass can change. And we just kind of sketched out some thoughts here on that. But um, there have been a, a, there's a growing evidence in the paper that with cardio-oncology and the anthracycline therapies in particular, that um, some patients do experience cardiac atrophy. And um, mm. in a, a recent analysis we published in Stark Heart Failure, those changes in uh, reductions in LV mass were associated with heart failure symptoms more so, more so than the ejection fraction. And so I think um, moving to technologies um, like this and working out some of the details, such as you know, accounting for body surface area, will help us in understanding what are the, the underlying causes for the ECB changes. Hmm. I think that's a, a very, very important aspect. And that's, uh, to me, that was the takeaway of uh, the, these papers. One, we have to learn a little bit more about the tissue characteristics and uh, what exactly is going on. And the other, let's be just careful and try to really understand very well what you're doing when we're using some of these markers. And uh, as shown in this, in this figure and was really beautifully done, uh, congratulations, Jennifer, for, for, for that. Um, there, there are, there are, and, and you called it nominator and denominator. So there are, you, you, there are several screws that are turned, and depending on uh, in which direction this is going, 
and how far this is turned, uh, we may find uh, an increase or an unchanged or a decrease of extracellular space. So I think that's, that is something that, uh, is, uh, uh, that makes it a little bit more complex, but on the other hand, of course, also much more powerful. So um, thank you very much. Is, are there any other, um, any other uh, um, questions or comments? If, uh, if not, I want to thank uh, everybody for joining. I want to thank Fabian and uh, Jeanette uh, for uh, the work and also for being around for the discussion. Uh, Negari for presenting the, the second uh, paper, uh, which was a big task, and for, for the interesting comments and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, discussions. So I want to briefly point, and I'm, I hope nobody sues me uh, from you, or not sues me, nobody uh, will... Uh, put that against me. I will give you a preview where I'm not even allowed. Where, where, I don't know whether I'm allowed, but in two weeks we will present the update of the Lake Louise uh, criteria. And uh, the paper is not published yet. It is in, in press, but it's not even uh, online available. It will be uh, in about a week from now, uh, but here's a very quick peek. So this is what we will what will be published in, in two weeks and we will discuss this paper. So the update of the Lake Louise criteria and also a, uh, a review and meta-analysis of the diagnostic accuracy of CMR in acute myocarditis, which was very timely, basically appeared shortly before um, the, the update, but uh, fits very well what uh, we had discussed. So this is what we will show in two weeks and discuss. So we'll have Vanessa Ferreira around, probably some other authors of the, of the Lake Louise paper. And I'm really looking forward to that uh, because we have worked for almost three years on this uh, update. And uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a very good one. So with that, I want to thank everybody for their participation. And I hope you, know, you enjoyed it. And uh, you, please leave some feedback uh, to us um, on, on the website or send me an email. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I would be looking forward to welcoming you back in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.